Hartelijk welkom bij Estafette. Voor dit laatste gesprek zijn wij aangeland bij het wereldberoemde Divinity College in Boston. Hier ontmoeten wij iemand die geboren werd in Roemenië. Als kind ging ze op de vlucht voor de oorlog en later studeerde ze theologie in Duitsland. Nu doseert ze aan deze Harvard Universiteit in Massachusetts. Ze werd de leidende figuur in het feministische denken in theologie en kerk. En ze ontdekte dat vooral vrouwen een veel belangrijkere rol hebben gespeeld dan aanvankelijk werd gedacht. Mag ik je voorstellen aan Elisabeth Schussler Fiorenza. Professor Elisabeth Schussler Fiorenza, good afternoon. Where were you born? I was born in Romania. That was uh, previously belonged to Austria Hungary as a, a monarchy and uh, was um, uh, partitioned and uh, is a border town between Romania, Hungary and um, Yugos former Yugoslavia uh, or Serbia and um, I grew up there until the war and during the war I uh, we fled uh, because there was street fighting when the Russians moved in, uh, the Germans moved out, the people moved from village to village and we ended up in first in Austria and then in in Bavaria and then we moved to where I grew up in Franken uh, which is around 70 kilometers Frankfurt Würzburg, Heidelberg, mm -hmm. in this area. So I, uh, one of my most liveliest memories is my mother um, never could go out and because we, they didn't take much with them. They had uh, packed a little bit uh, like a suitcase full of good clothes, but nothing for normal days <laughs> and, and no food and so on. So my mother never um, managed to go begging. My grandmother always did it. Uh, in order to get food and she, so she went begging begging uh, yeah because she couldn't otherwise have uh, food so um, i remember quite uh, distinctly that um, she got some cake from someone and um, the children in my family the children always get things first so the chi we children had the cake and we enjoyed it very much and I could not understand why all the grown-ups were standing around crying and saying, these poor children, they will never get any, any uh, cake to eat in their life. And every time I eat cake, I say, oh, <laughs> that's probably why I eat too much cake. <laughs> yes. Of this memory. So I have, um, I have these snapshot memories uh, of it, and, uh, which are more interesting than actually um, Disturbing when if I would have been older, it would have been quite a different experience. I think mm -hmm. it I, I grew up. Uh, I mean, I was born in a border town, but it also um, has become almost a kind of a symbol for my life to be always on the borders and always uh, to to transgress borders. Uh, so so that's why I say it is not uh, for me. It is not a terrible memory but it is it's a memory which is very realistic and when I talk to people here who have never experienced war I always realize how different uh, my childhood was for example from that of my daughter or that of Francis. Mm -hmm. Did uh, these experiences in the war of not having enough to eat um, influence you in your later choices you made in life? Well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, my uh, whole theological approach in terms of liberation theological approach is uh, is uh, influenced by this because I think um, we can understand uh, the situation of others um, only uh, fully if we have some similar experiences and um, for me, uh, I mean, the most, uh, the greatest number of people today are really displaced persons, if you look at it. And um, uh, the migration, uh, which is part of the globalization issue, is um, a very 
important fact in our life and I think has not been taken seriously enough in uh, the area of theology or uh, religious reflection. Um, I have uh, argued that because of the discussion here about so-called resident aliens or alien residents and aliens are some people from outer space um, and the difficulty for people here to, especially from Mexico and uh, Latin America, to get a uh, 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 visa in order to stay here and, and to be permanent immigrants here. Um, I have argued that feminist theologians uh, ought to understand ourselves as resident aliens within the church as well as within the academy. So I, I think uh, being born in a border town, having transgressed many borders uh, in my life when I was quite young, uh, has had a great impact on my theological thinking. Why did you go to America then? Uh, Francis, my husband, uh, and we met as students, got married, and uh, uh, he is American, uh, and he would have had no chance in Germany to get, because if America is uh, very reluctant to let in immigrants, uh, Germany is worse against foreigners. <laughs> so, so he would have had no, ch uh, no chance of, of a career in Germany. And I, as a woman, as a Roman Catholic woman, uh, had no chance at all. But uh, the real reason is why we came to, st uh, why we settled in the States uh, and not in Germany is because um, there was no possibility for women in uh, Germany to do theology. My understanding, uh, women become feminists when they realize that their socialization and what they actually want to do are in conflict. So for me, there was a conflict in terms of the socialization um, into femininity. And uh, my love for books, my love for reading, my love for intellectual issues. And this kind of conflict, I think, is the roots of my feminism. What uh, attracts you to theology? Um, but I'm interested in um, theology is, um, you could say I have began, I have started uh, to study theology uh, during the council, or just before the council, then Pope John uh, announced the council, and then the council came. And um, I remember quite clearly I had made a promise. Uh, there was a rumor that Karana would be silenced. And I had made a promise if um, Karana would be silenced, I would have nothing to do with theology, and I would do probably sociology. Um, but if Karana would not be silenced, I would do theology. And Karana was not silenced, and I um, and the council came, and theology was exciting because you could ask all kind of questions. For me, for me, studying theology was opening was intellectually exciting, liberating, and was liberating because it um, meant um, that uh, you were that intellectual freedom meant uh, that, uh, uh, oh, and for me, good theology was uh, that you had the intellectual freedom to ask the questions you needed to ask, whether or not they were conform uh, with the doctrinal system or not. It's almost hard to explain this because we are now again in a period where they try to close all doors and windows, and I'm sure if I would be a young woman today, I would not, a young Catholic woman today, I would not go and study theology. Wouldn't you? No, in terms of, I would maybe come to Harvard and study it, where you have a, a kind of um, inter-religious atmosphere, and where you have a place where 
uh, you can still ask all the questions, but if I would go to ca Catholic institutions, and in Germany you have to go to Catholic or Protestant institutions, um, today uh, there is a lot of the freedom which was there uh, during the council and uh, through the council is, uh, is already uh, cut down. For instance, um, I got just a letter asking me to react to this new stupid uh, regulation from Rome, and uh, I got a letter and saying uh, from the Women's Ordination Conference, and they said, "We ask you because uh, nobody in Catholic institution can afford to look at it critically." Or, for instance, um, in Germany, uh, you did not have women for a long time, uh, women, uh, uh, Catholic women, as professors because of the Concordat which the Church did with Hitler. And um, Sylvia Schreuer was denied, uh, was not given uh, the uh, um, permission uh, to do theology, and what she had said was very mild in comparison. Um, and I understand now that uh, two feminists have been appointed in Germany to chairs, but the condition was that they publicly made it known that they agreed with the Pope on the question of women's ordination. So that is how bad the situation today is already in terms of a Catholic kind of context and framework. You have become well known for your pioneering New Testament study. You wrote a book in memory of her. It's an intriguing title. Uh, the title of the book in, uh, comes from a story in Mark's Gospel, uh, which is also found in Matthew and in a very different form in Luke's text. And the story is about a woman anointing Jesus' uh, head uh, and um, at the end of the story, um, it is said uh, that what she has done uh, will be told in memory of her. Uh, and uh, wherever the gospel is proclaimed. And so I took uh, this um, as a, a leitmotiv to move into the whole a uh, new reconstruction of uh, Christian origins in feminist terms. Um, I uh, try to unravel in the story, with the story, um, that although the text is quite explicitly saying what she has done will be told in memory of her, uh, most Christians do not know anything about this woman. And uh, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, uh, certainly what she has done is not uh, told. And uh, so I was taking this as a paradigm for the situation of uh, women in early Christ in history, and in early, particularly in early Christian history, that um, women have participated in religion, women have participated in especially in the beginnings of religion and uh, in the beginnings of Christianity. But um, what they have done is forgotten and is uh, not told. So the uh, theological consciousness that the gospel, to say it is the other way around, cannot be proclaimed if what uh, women have done is not told uh, has been lost, and you could say the other history, uh, the history that has become predominant in um, the history of Christianity, the texts, uh, these, uh, those texts uh, which are also in, uh, in the Christian Testament, are those texts that say women should be silenced and women should not speak in public or women should not uh, speak in church. Um, these texts have made history, but uh, the text uh, which is ascribed to Jesus in Mark's Gospel, that wherever the Gospel is proclaimed, what she has done 
will be told in memory of her, in remembrance of her, uh, that these texts have never been realized in history and uh, that uh, we are at a moment uh, that through the feminist movement we can recover this part of the gospel story. It was very interesting to me. I had a long um, debate when the book was pu uh, published in German because uh, the German publisher did not want to have the title exactly because of this allusion to the Lord's uh, Supper. Uh, Why? Said, Why? They thought it was too much uh, or they could not quite bring the two together. And when was it? Because, um, because what I do is really to put, a, by choosing this title, to put the woman and the memory of the woman on the same level with the memory of Jesus. And uh, for some churchmen that is a little difficult. When you investigated uh, women, the role of women in New Testament, I wonder what was your most remarkable discovery? Um, I don't know. I, I think why uh, In Memory of Her has become uh, so influential is because uh, it brings together, it, it places women in the center of uh, the historiography and therefore uh, assumes uh, that women are central figures. And I think that is um, get against all our cultural kinds of sensibilities and especially also our religious and theological sensibilities. Um, and it does so in terms of the uh, theoretical uh, frameworks that are available to scholars today. So, so I, I really think um, what, what I have done uh, is opened up a whole new field of studies just by this, um, uh, this move to place women in the center. Were you conscious you were doing that? Um, I was very conscious because uh, at one point I used to work nights and uh, in the middle of the night I, I had all this material but somehow it did not gel, it did not come together and at uh, one point it, uh, it came clear to me that my problem was that I wrote for two different audiences. I had from the beginning said that I wanted to do a scholarly book but in the 70s, um, in many, and I wanted to do a feminist book, but in the 70s, in many feminist circles, for instance, um, scholarship was male. And uh, for many scholars, feminism was ideology. So I, I, try, I, I realized suddenly that I tried to bring the impossible two together. <laughs> and I realized that, and I said to myself, Elizabeth, you're crazy because feminists won't read the book <laughs> because it's male scholarship. And uh, male schol uh, or, uh, scholars uh, or the guild won't read the book because it's feminist. And, um, when I realized this contradiction, I, I decided I wanted to do uh, it, have it a feminist perspective, but still keep my male, which I don't believe in, but keep as a scholarly kind of uh, approach. And, um, and it turned out I was wrong. I mean, it, it turned out that uh, many feminists, many women, around the world have found the book helpful, but uh, it is also a book which is here used in many college classes and, and in many seminaries, so uh, it also had some impact in the academy. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I think it is because it opens up a new kind of field uh, which is uh, feminist studies in early Christianity.
You suggest that after Jesus' death, women spread the gospel. Yeah, what uh, is striking in terms of the gospels, um, Paul uh, says uh, that um, the basic Christian confession was that Jesus uh, died, uh, he was buried, and he was raised uh, from the dead. And uh, if you look at the gospel texts, um, then in all gospels, it's a woman uh, among them, leading among them, Mary of Magdala, who are present at the execution of Jesus, it's a burial of Jesus, and uh, who are proclaiming the resurrection, uh, or are told to proclaim the resurrection. So uh, you could say um, that, uh, that there is already in the Gospels a kind of competition going on in the texts uh, between uh, Peter and Mary of Magdala, who is, is the first, yeah. yeah. Who is the first? Is it Peter or is it Mary of Magdala? And um, for instance, in the Gospel of John, the story is so told that Peter is, becomes the first and Mary only has after the story begins with Mary and then a Peter story is in, sliced in and then uh, the story of Mary uh, uh, of Magdala and uh, Jesus is finished. So, uh, so you can see how it's at work and why we can say so is because especially um, uh, the texts uh, which have been found uh, in Nag Hammadi and uh, so-called Gnostic texts um, and also uh, later um, uh, later texts have practically, uh, especially uh, anti-Montanist texts, have practically a debate going on between Peter and Mary of Magdala, who understood the resurrection best. So, um, so I always say, um, if you have a chair of Peter, a catheter of Peter, we need to have a catheter of Mary of Magdala. And there you can see how how texts uh, that uh, are, um, how texts whether on a text become historically effective and have impact historically depends on who is developing them. So um, uh, the great church has developed Peter, but not Mary of Magdala. If you look at what happened to Mary of Magdala in the Western tradition, not in the Eastern church, but in the Western church tradition, Mary of Magdala is still recognized by some of uh, the uh, church fathers and early medieval theologians as the apostle to the apostles. Uh, but at the same time, uh, she is identified with uh, the public sinner who in Luke anoints Jesus, and uh, she becomes uh, therefore the prostitute and uh, the whore. Uh, and I, uh, like when I taught at Notre Dame, which is a Catholic university, I, uh, at a college, I uh, would always say, and they were very anxious to get good grades, and so I would always say, if you say Mary of Magdala was a whore <laughs> or a prostitute, you will drop, your grade will drop <laughs> two grades <laughs> down. But yes. even, the, even this thread didn't help. I mean, you would still get students who would, uh, would insist that Mary is, uh, was a prostitute. And if you look at Jesus Christ superstars on modern culture, it still elaborates the same kind of, um, uh, of uh, bad woman kind of mm -hmm. motif which the tradition, Christian tradition has uh, elaborated. I wanted to ask some general questions. Mm -hmm. Who is God to you? Why is that an important question? Um, well, I mean, uh, how me, do you how do you picture Let me reformulate it. Whoever God to me is um, does not really matter as long as I don't say uh, my God ought to be your God. That means uh, the dangerous thing of uh, religion is always not that they articulate who God is for them, but uh, that they articulate who God should be for others. So 
the, uh, for me, uh, the issue of God is really a question, uh, a theological question, and um, in feminist terms, a question of language. I, I have emphasized so strongly the issue of language, and uh, traditional theology has always uh, said that our language is inadequate, human language is inadequate uh, to speak about God. Um, so for, in my understanding, what is uh, important for the theologian is exactly that we look very critically and very carefully at how we speak about God. And because uh, how we speak about God um, will uh, depend uh, or will have implications on how we treat people. And um, religions have too much used God in order to, uh, against other people. And um, uh, in feminist uh, terms, you have a big discussion about uh, whether our God language in the tradition as well as in scripture is male. So the um, uh, feminists have insisted because our language, and especially male grammatically male language, is inadequate for God. We have to revisit all our speaking about God uh, if we do not want to continue to reinforce through God language the second class uh, citizenship of women, uh, and. Uh, there uh, have been many different suggestions made on how to speak about God. What does prayer mean to you? Again, <laughs> that is, uh, the questions come from a kind of new age spirituality, which, uh, <laughs> which um, I have a difficulty with. Uh, I should give you back, uh, Matthew has a nice text which I usually quote because uh, generally, a uh, religion uh, or religious practice is understood in terms of prayer or in terms of liturgy. And uh, that is seen as a typical Christian. But if you look at, uh, at the Gospel text, for instance, in Matthew's text, uh, we have a clear-cut statement. If you pray, don't do it publicly. Go in your pantry, close the door, and then you pray. That means uh, prayer is not, uh, not something for public consumption, but prayer is something between you and God. And you be careful that you do not make it something for public consumption. How would you define your relationship with traditional Catholic Church? Um, my relationship, I always say I'm as Catholic as the Pope is. <laughs> so, because, <laughs> because I have uh, <clears throat> I, I've grown up in, in a term of kind of uh, folk Catholicism and um, and that is quite different from the American Catholicism, that is, immigrant Catholicism. So in, for me, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, the council is very decisive, and the council uh, has, um, understands the church as uh, the baptized, or as the people of God. And uh, the hierarchy, what you probably mean with I do. <laughs> vision <laughs> church, and the hierarchy are there for the service of the people of God. And so for me, um, um, church is not to be identified with the hierarchy. How do you picture the ideal church? Um, I would say that uh, one of uh, my utopian expressions is discipleship of equals um, in uh, terms of uh, church. Um, I would think as a minimum, 
and there I again am very much um, formed by uh, council theology. Uh, I would think two things: with uh, the, ch uh, the church uh, ought to be, uh, as uh, theologians say, church is a sacrament of salvation, and uh, if one takes salvation out of the traditional kind of theological con uh, uh, lingo and translate it with liberation, then the church needs to be the sacrament of liberation and, or in other words, the church needs to be um, the sacrament of justice in a world of injustice. Um, and that means that within the church, the church cannot be the sacrament of justice if within the church you don't have just structures. What are most important problems of present-day society? Uh, for me, uh, the most uh, problematic issues are still uh, the uh, issues of um, racism, sexism, of all the isms, but especially also in terms of neoliberalism and uh, in terms of the globalization, uh, what I began in the beginning, the uprooting of people and uh, the disenfranchisement of people. Um, the former Labour Secretary Reich, uh, who is, was also a professor here at Harvard, uh, has uh, projected and uh, that if nothing drastically changes is that in the next uh, years, uh, around 70 to 80 percent of the world population will be um, under the poverty level. Uh, that means will be condemned uh, to impoverishment, whereas only uh, 10 to 15 percent will have enough to live. And uh, that is an alarming kind of projection for the future. What is the role of church and religion in the 21st century? There I would, would like uh, to say uh, the uh, 21st century, uh, I mean, there will be a big uh, celebration that uh, the millennium and the change, that is a typical Christian kind of view of the world and <laughs> of history. So I, I would say the role uh, will not be different than in the 20th century, uh, but I would think that uh, religion and churches will only um, have, insofar as they lose more and more uh, the instruments of power which they have gained uh, from the state, um, will only have significance if they are uh, uh, justice uh, promoting religions or churches and if they are able in their own vision and theology to articulate this as a spirituality of global justice. Thank you, Professor Schüssler-Fiorenza, for this interview. You're welcome.